Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Finance Watch Dialogue on the Gender Perspective in Financial Inclusion. My name is Emily Glantz. I'm a Researcher, Advocacy, and Strategy Assistant at Finance Watch, and I will be your moderator today. So I just wanted to start things off with a little bit of an introduction um, to the topic. So while gender equality has been a political issue for centuries, relatively little time has been dedicated to exploring gender-based issues in financial inclusion. Uh, financial inclusion being a process where through the interlinking components of access, usability, knowledge, and social structures, individuals are enabled to use safe, affordable, and suitable financial products and tools, and therefore have the opportunity for a decent, decent so socioeconomic life. Uh, your time and attention over the next hour are greatly appreciated. Uh, second, I just wanted to extend a thank you to the commissioner, uh, Helena Dali and her team for the work being done to strengthen the European Union's commitment to inclusion and equality, for leading the fight against discrimination, for pushing forward to implement the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and for the de development of the European Gender Strategy. We'd also like to thank the Commissioner for her appetite to learn more about gender-based issues and financial inclusion and for helping us to raise awareness. Finally, a warm and heartfelt thank you to my fellow panelists for joining us today to share their knowledge and expertise, and to my colleagues at Finance Watch for helping to support and organize this event. Uh, today, we will have the opportunity to hear from Professor of Economics, Marcella Corsi, from the Sapienza University of Rome. In addition to her work as an educator and researcher, Marcella has worked as a consultant to the OECD, European Parliament, and European Commission. Her current research focuses on gender equality, poverty, social investment, and the empowerment of women. She is also the chief editor of the International Review of Sociology. We will also have the opportunity to learn from Patricia Suarez Ramirez, the founder of ASUFIN, the Spanish Consumer Association specialized in the protection of financial users. Patricia also serves as a consumer representative on the European Banking Authority's Advisory Council and sits on the board of directors at Finance Watch. I will also be giving a brief presentation of issues at the nexus of gender equality and access to basic financial tools and services necessary to live a normal, dignified life here in the EU. As this is a dialogue, following the presentations, there will be an opportunity for members in the audience to raise questions and discuss the issues at hand. So when questions come to mind during the presentations, please send them to us through the Q&A section. I believe it should be in the bottom right corner of your screen. Make sure to select the option to send your question or comment to all panelists so it does not get overlooked. So with the agenda set, we are pleased to have the EU Commissioner for Equality here to open the dialogue. Uh, Commissioner Dali, the floor is yours. Good morning, and thank you for organizing this very important uh, seminar on, on uh, Man mainstreaming gender and, and finance policy, which I think is key for achieving women's economic independence and progressing towards a gender equal economy and society. Financial services are part of everyone's daily lives. And to achieve inclusive access to financial services, it is important to promote financial literacy. Increased financial literacy will mean that women, too, will develop the awareness, know-how and tools to manage their finances more actively. Together with the OECD, we are currently developing a financial competence framework, listing all the knowledge and skills people should acquire in order to maximize the benefit of using financial services. It is also important to tackle gender stereotypes and resulting behaviors that weaken women's financial independence. For instance, men's control over bank accounts in the household or ownership of property. Tackling gender stereotypes is a key part of the EU gender equality strategy, and the Commission will launch an EU-wide communication campaign on this topic with a focus on youth. Gender stereotypes also fuel the gender gap in the financial services sector, in particular at management levels. In 2019, the proportion of women in leadership roles was 22%. And although this is projected to grow to 31% by 2030, 
this will still be well below parity. Another angle of the gender perspective in financial inclusion is women's access to finance as entrepreneurs and investors. In equity, over 90% of venture capital raised by European companies in 2020 went to teams that did not have a single female founder. The investment community is male dominated. Only 10% of decision makers in venture capital firms are women. And yet, gender diverse companies and funds generate better financial results and more innovation. Moreover, women often invest long term and are driven by social or environmental impacts. Our investment program, Invest EU, intends to tackle this inequality by offering an integrated investment framework to stimulate gender smart finance. We will provide incentives to female led and diverse investment funds so that they can, in turn, invest more in women-led companies. The Commission also addresses the gender aspects of the broader social inclusion agenda. For instance, the European Pillar of Social Rights Action Plan commits to an inclusive high employment rate of 78% by 2030. To achieve it, we must strive to halve the gender employment gap compared to 2019, when it stood at 11.8 percentage points. Our proposal on pay transparency aims to ensure that women and men get equal pay for equal work. Our, mi our minimum wages proposal contributes to reducing the gender pay gap as the majority of minimum wage earners are women. Fostering women's access to financial resources and services, their participation and decision-making power in the financial sector and over their own finances, and ensuring gender equal pay and pensions are all essential for achieving a union of equality where all women and girls can thrive, lead and be free. I thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it's very great to hear about all the work that's going on at the commission level, and we really hope that we can support that not only through this dialogue, but as our uh, continued research happens and collaboration together with other networks. Um, with that, I would like to hand over the floor to Marcella Corsi, who will be presenting on uh, financial literacy and uh, women's struggle in financial services. Many thanks to Emily for the introduction and of course to the commissioner for having uh, found some time to spend uh, here with us today. Um, I'll start sharing my screen and I switch off my video so to improve the connection. So here we are. Uh, well, um, as the commissioner has just said, there are several data that show uh, the existence of a gender finance gap. Um, we certainly don't have the time today to explore all of them. And as a matter of fact, uh, I give them for granted, hopefully, all of us are aware uh, of the many uh, gaps uh, that have been uh, already um, uh, re reminded by, by the commissioner, but also available in, in the literature. Um, uh, vice versa, uh, I concentrate my attention today on the emergency uh, related to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and how the COVID-19 has even increased the urgency of finding uh, a way out uh, of these uh, gaps. Um, just a quick reminder, I think is uh, is compulsory. Uh, this is the definition uh, by the OECD um, uh, and Commissioner Dali uh, just uh, actually shown the relevance of so the connection between the OECD and, and the European Commission on this field. Um, so um, this is the definition uh, by the OECD, is a well-known uh, quotation by 
uh, Atkinson and Messi um, related to the definition of, of the link between financial inclusion and financial literacy. Uh, what we are talking about is financial awareness and education with a view to promote financial well-being as well as economic and social inclusion. So we are basically uh, going to the heart uh, of the issue related to uh, social inclusion or vice versa, uh, social exclusion uh, uh, all over the world and especially also in Europe. Um, but why is financial literacy uh, and of course financial inclusion so important now? Well, as a matter of fact, even before the pandemic, there was an urgency related to the greater complexity in financial markets, uh, the, greater, uh, um, the greater amount of opportunities uh, to borrow and in large amounts. Uh, we all are aware, of course, of the risk uh, also these large amounts, inverted commas, in terms of uh, uh, non-performing loans. Uh, there is an issue related to the privatization of pension systems. Uh, this is particularly relevant also in a gender perspective. And there is, of course, uh, a, a crucial issue related to the changes in technology. And this is, of course, also related to the Next Generation EU program, the issue of digitalization within the Next Generation EU, and so on. When I speak about the changes in technology, referring to financial inclusion and financial literacy, of course, I refer mostly to the rise of fintech and internet banking, but even more to the issue of cryptocurrencies, bitcoins, and blockchain that Finance Watch is addressing also in a separate as a separate issue. So, having this in mind, why financial literacy and financial exclusion is so important for women? I don't go back to the pay gap uh, that is well known, um, um, and we know that at the moment the European Parliament uh, once more is dealing with this issue, also in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, legislation and, and directives. Um, we all know, uh, and it was reminded by, by the Commissioner, uh, the, the the small proportion of high income position or senior position for women, uh, especially in the financial sector. We all know about uh, the, the, the issue of part-time work uh, for women and for men and the large gap uh, in this direction. Um, we, we know about uh, uh, the issue of uh, women working fewer years than men uh, with the greater risk uh, in terms of, um, of retirement and, uh, and pension, uh, pension gap, pension income gap. Um, and so on. I could go on and on for for a very long list of issues to be taken into account. But as a matter of fact, uh, what is really important to 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 deal with are the social norms that influence and somehow constraints also uh, the uh, activities in order to fight uh, the social exclusion uh, of, of women uh, towards men. Um, I, I, I show you just this uh, figure, just this uh, uh, chart uh, taken by, uh, taken from, sorry, uh, a UN Women 2020 pilot studies, uh, a pilot study on stereotypical, uh, stereotypical uh, uh, attitudes. As you can see, it refers to several countries in the world, uh, and especially the largest countries in the world. Uh, um, and basically, they uh, this is, these are just the answers to a very uh, simple question. Uh, do you believe that women and men uh, have a lot of control over their uh, personal finances? Well, as you can see, the answers for women are, uh, are on the top and the answers for men are, are below. Uh, generally speaking, only 57% of, intervie of interviewed women have declared to have a lot of control over their personal finances with large differences, of course, among countries. The most uh, is in the United States. Um, vice versa, 71% of men have declared to have a lot of control over their personal finances. Uh, once again, uh, there are several differences uh, all over the world, uh, but have a look at Nigeria, um, where 
86% of men have declared to have a control on their finances uh, against uh, uh, only 50% of women. Of course, as you all know, Nigeria is a, is a strategic country, especially due to the large population and the increasing population of that country in Africa. Um, and uh, let's come now to the pandemic. Uh, these are other data that I think are very interesting in order to have a proper discussion about this issue. Uh, this is a, a survey, once again, a new survey carried out between April and July 2020 by Eurofound. So we're talking about uh, uh, European data this time. Um, it, it has been uh, done during the, the, the first lockdown uh, due to the pandemic. Um, and of course, uh, um, it, it, it's very relevant for us uh, in order to understand what are the actual uh, challenges uh, in terms of financial inclusion and, and, and literacy. As you can see, the gender gap this time, uh, which I highlighted here, taking into account men and women, uh, refers to the number of people who have lost their job uh, during, uh, during the lockdown uh, or because of the lockdown. Uh, of course, not only the biological sex is relevant, uh, you should have a time to look at the differences in, in age, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in contractual status, uh, and uh, also in terms of education. But just start for women and men. Uh, we all know, I hope, we all know that we are facing a she session. So uh, the, one of the main consequences of the pandemic uh, is the increase uh, in uh, in the gender gap in employment uh, and in unemployment, uh, which means uh, for us uh, greater financial fragility for all, for sure, but especially for women. Um, and uh, once once again, uh, starting from the same source of data, so Eurofound. Uh, 47% of respondents uh, to that ESRB that I mentioned before reported that their household had difficulties making hands meet. In July, that same number was 44%. But as a matter of fact, there are more women than men reporting that their household has difficulties making hands meet. 47%, 47% in the case of women compared to 40%. And this difference uh, has increased between April and July from three to seven uh, percentage points. So this is something new for us, uh, not because it changes this overall scenario, but because it makes it more critical. And, and finally, um, once again, uh, same sorts uh, of information. Um, what are the expectations for these households, uh, uh, taking into account the different countries uh, and taking into account, of course, uh, uh, a, a short time span? Because uh, during the pandemic, is very it was very difficult to have a, a longer time span uh, in order to understand what were the challenges uh, for all the European and uh, households. So basically, the, the respondents this time were reporting their financial situation will get worse in three months' time. Once again, as you can see, the situation is, is, is very different uh, among uh, uh, the different countries. Uh, but as a matter of fact, 25% uh, of households uh, were having were, th were thinking to have uh, a, a critical situation and so a higher, uh, greater financial fragility in the next uh, three months. Uh, obviously, we don't have uh, uh, data for the time being to confirm uh, or, or to say something different. But as a matter of fact, this is once again an urgency in terms of a gender perspective to be taken on board uh, when discussing the issue that we are discussing today. Thank you. Ah, sorry, there was another. Uh, do I have another minute, uh, Emily, or am I already out of time? Yeah, go ahead. One more minute. Okay, great. So this is really the last, uh, the last chart. And then I close. Um, in terms of resilience, uh, we all know. I mean, our uh, recovery plan uh, is using resilience as a keyword. Um, so are women and men different in terms of resilience uh, and in terms of degree 
or resilience? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, once again, this is the same source of data. And by the way, if uh, the, I allow, of course, uh, uh, my charts to be distributed afterwards, uh, and you can see there is a link also to the publication, which is the source of this information. I invite all of you to have a look at the publication itself. Is very rich of uh, information in this direction. So women exhibit low resilience uh, more often than men. And by the way, this gap increased during the lockdowns. This was certainly uh, caused, uh, first of all, uh, by the she session that I mentioned before. So by the lack of occupation and the degree uh, and, the, and the increase of, of unemployment, but has also depended on the uh, challenges related to the lockdown. First of all, uh, the so-called uh, uh, smart working effect, uh, which has put a lot of pressure uh, physically and psychologically on women uh, in, in a situation in which uh, uh, schools uh, were closed, uh, um, health services uh, uh, could not be provided uh, and so on. Uh, so the care work, uh, which is usually uh, distributed unequally within our households, uh, uh, it was even more unequal uh, between women and men. And this made uh, the perception of, of, of women even uh, worse uh, than, than, uh, than that for men. Um, as I said, uh, we still have to look at uh, uh, the real data uh, that will be available uh, next year. I'm afraid, uh, but um, this is the scenario on which uh, we, we now must uh, reason about uh, financial fragility and gender gaps. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Marcella. A lot of good points made there. First off, that we need to have data on what's going on to get a real sense of, of how to react. Also, the sense of urgency, I, I share that as well with you. Um, one more moment here. I'm just going to share my screen and we'll move on to my presentation in a moment. Okay, so I just kind of wanted to take a step back and get a broad overview perspective of the barriers to access and basic financial services that we see drawn along uh, gender based lines. So, as a quick refresher, we know that financial inclusion is a process of ensuring all individuals can access and employ financial tools and services that are needed to live a normal and dignified life. We also know that gender is a social construct. As a concept, the concept, the term gender did not uh, become used in the formal way that it is today until the 1950s, and it didn't enter the mainstream until much later. Uh, it continues to be con confused with the term sex, which is a biological characteristic, and I don't feel that I need to give examples on this confusion. We see it a lot in the mainstream today. So in most human cultures today, gender is a binary concept, meaning that characteristics, behaviors, roles, responsibilities are divided into two categories, feminine and masculine. And studies continue to reveal that the children of today are socialized into accepting or internalizing, internalizing these concepts early on, with masculine traits being viewed as desirable traits to possess and with boys being encouraged to avoid developing feminine traits. So very few modern states today have a custom of publicly and legally recognizing more than two genders, though we do observe a greater recognition of gender as a spectrum over the last 30 years. It is very encouraging to see civil society and popular culture confronting outdated concepts of gender, making sincere efforts to improve the social inclusion of members of the LGBTQ community and combat homophobia and transphobia. At Finance Watch, one of our main goals is to foster the transition to a financial system that works for all, especially individuals who are vulnerable to financial exclusion. Given the fact that collecting data is a difficult task in and of itself, and that we are still in the infancy or embryonic stage of our journey toward becoming experts on the barriers to financial inclusion faced by members of our EU community who do not fit neatly into this uh, binary gender categories, the focus of today's discussion will be largely on issues facing women and men. Uh, I will also do my best to highlight issues related to intersectionality or how these barriers to access and use of tools, both in their nature and severity change when an individual's socially constructed gender is coupled with other characteristics, such as their age, race, belief, or geographical location. So I had mentioned at the beginning of the hour that financial inclusion is dependent upon a set of interactive components that enable an individual to access and use financial tools and services. 
So um, Finance Watch has previously identified these basics or keys needed for financial inclusion. So you see credit here is an intentionally set in gray apart from the rest, which are in black um, because it's necessity is still debated, though we do see near universal use of credit products in some member states, especially when it comes to using a mortgage credit to purchase a home, but also in terms of consumer credit, like a credit card, personal loan, car loan, or that sort of thing. And we do see differences in the way that women are accessing those credits. So when we explore the pathways to ensuring financial inclusion for each financial tool or service, we have to consider all of these components and how they interact. Access, usability, knowledge, and social structures. It is paramount here to consider how these components are affected by an individual's social identities and life circumstances, and how that might result in privilege, meaning that products and social structures put into place support that individual's inclusion, or when and how these products or social structures are not designed to foster inclusion. Simply put, financial inclusion is not equal. The way that products and social infrastructures are designed, think employment, childcare, pension earnings, prioritize the needs and preferences of some while overlooking the needs and preferences of others. And we'll do some thinking about that today. On the one hand, we need to ensure safe, affordable, and suitable products exist to meet individuals where they're at in their lives. And as Marcello pointed out, it's important that individuals are aware of these products, they have the knowledge, and important that they're taking hold of their financial future and aware of the risks involved in certain products. And on the other hand, we need to ensure that the proper social infrastructure is put into place to enable individuals to actually understand, access, and use these tools to their advantage. Building up the social and physical infrastructure to foster inclusion, uh, make up the building blocks or principles that are enshrined into the European pillar of social rights. All member states agreed to implement the European pillar of social rights in 2017. If we don't substantially address the structural issues linked to these social rights, it does not matter what kind of financial products we create. Those at a disadvantage will not be able to use them. If we don't build up the actual physical structures, social programs, and legal rights to foster secure and adaptable employment for all in the green and digital transitions, accessible quality lifelong training, affordable and quality childcare and long-term care, and employment agreements which encourage and allow both parents to participate in the care of their children, adequate unemployment benefits, a minimum income, we will continue to have a system that is not designed to include all. Certain individuals will not be able to build up an adequate pension in their old age. They will not be able to afford the insurance that they need and the insurance that they, and that that insurance could mean the difference between economic stability or hardship in the inevitable event of an accident, illness, or death in the family. They will not be able to create a buffer of savings against the unknown crises of the future. So we applaud the commission on their ongoing work to bring the principles of the European pillar of social rights into reality. It is going to take many hands and minds to make this possible. And we're honored and humbled to be a part of that work. For today, we won't be able to take a dive, a deep dive in any case, into all the gender related issues regarding access or use of that basic set of tools or keys that I introduced. But I wanna take a moment to reflect on some and give a few recommendations on how these can be addressed. So there's a lot of talk about digitalization these days. And alongside that, we see a retreat in the use of cash. So the swift shift to touchless payments and since debunked fears over viral transmission through banknotes brought on the, by the pandemic decreased both the use and the acceptance of cash. Many would have you believe that cash is dead and the future is nothing but digital. Across the EU, we see a general trend with bank branches and ATMs disappearing. Despite this, we know that cash continues to be used for a significant amount of transactions with varying use across the continent. Use of cash is especially popular among people of lower financial means, older people, and among those with a lower level of education or people living in rural areas. We know that women are, in general, more highly educated than men, but that they also continue to be paid less for performing the same work, and that low-wage sectors of the labor market are dominated by women. We also know that the gender pen pension gap is to the detriment of women, with the gap spanning from 2% in places like Estonia and Denmark to 44% in places like Luxembourg. We also know that in general, women are living longer lives on average than men across the EU, and so they must stretch out these smaller pensions for a longer period of time. 
So it feels safe then to guess that if cash is a preferred method of payment for older people, those living on a low income, et cetera, that women make up a significant portion of this group of cash users. Cash then is a means of inclusion for many women. It protects an individual's right to privacy, safeguards against time of crisis or disruption of electronic systems, and it's a convenient way for people to budget their limited financial resources. It can also be a way for an individual to regain economic independence from an abuser, and I'll touch more on that in a moment. For now, it feels safe to say that if cash is not reaffirmed as an acceptable means of payment, and quotas for ATMs are not put into place to enable those living in rural areas to access cash, that we are putting women at risk of financial exclusion. To be clear, I think it's worth mentioning that the preference for cash is not just held by people, uh, by older people in the EU. So even in Sweden, where I'm coming to speak to you from today, we're a front runner in the transition to a cashless society, but still here, cash accounts for 12.8% of transactions. And a recent social survey found that while younger Swedes have been quick to embrace the digital payments craze that's going on right now, about 20% of 18 to 24 four-year-olds feel negatively about the decline in cash, cash usage. And this feeling grows with age based on that survey. Also on a macro scale, the Swedish Parliamentary Committee on Finance has recognized that the impact of tra transitioning to a cash-free society will not only affect inclusion, but it risks uh, certain, yeah, it, there, it poses certain risks to financial stability if digital payments are disrupted. So the Swedish central bank is now moving to maintain its cash infrastructure. So I read this as yet another signal that we must maintain this cash infrastructure, given that it is expensive to maintain bank branches, however, especially in sparsely populated areas, building up a network of banking facilities within post offices could be a great way to combat financial exclusion. We see examples of this in Ireland, Portugal, Germany, and France, to name a few, and hope these initiatives will be expanded with the potential for EU level recommendations to coordinate these efforts. Finally, we see issues to physical access for individuals living with impairments or disabilities that remain to be addressed. Though we applaud the work facilitated through the European Accessibility Act and European Standard Standardization Organizations for laying down the foundations to harmonize access standards to services across the continent. Before I move on to the next key to financial inclusion, I just wanted to highlight some changes in context to supplement what Marcella said about what we've witnessed over the course of the pandemic. So before the pandemic hit, we knew that women had been disproportionately responsible for the care of children, dependent family members, including elderly parents. Uh, within par partnerships, married or cohabitating couples, women are more likely to sh shoulder the major majority of care duties. And we know that 85% of single parent households are headed by women in the EU. That's 9.2 million families. The European Institute for Gender Equality has been tracking the gender differences in life circumstances since 2013 and has found that while gaps in pay and leadership positions are generally shrinking, again, I should note that this is for women as a whole and does not speak to the intersectional experiences of subcategories of women, that overall, the, the gap between men and women in their use of time, they've also found, is growing, with women increasing their overall care duties and decreasing their time spent participating in extracurricular curricular activities, which, by the way, is very often overlooked. Time spent socializing and participating in sports or other group hobbies is a natural part of human networking, so it should be noted that women are missing out on these opportunities. We also know that the nature of work has been changing with a 12.8% increase in part-time employment between 2008 and 2018 across the EU and similar spikes in growth of gig or on-call style work. According to the network of European public employment services, at least 25% of the part-time workforce is involuntarily part-time employed. And within this demographic, we see men and women giving a different reason for why they are involuntarily unemployed, with men saying it's because they can't find full-time work, problematic in and of itself, and women saying they're limited to working part-time because of their care duties. Women make up 75% of the part-time workforce across the EU, but made up 82% of the part-time workforce's job losses during the pandemic. So it's easy to imagine how these gender discrepancies put women into a situation where they could become economically vulnerable or may even become economically dependent. We also know that the response to the pandemic coincided with a spike in domestic abuse cases, with shelter and counseling services reportedly overwhelmed by the increased demand for assistance. We echo the call by age 
that these services be considered mandatory so that victims of domestic abuse can access these life-saving services around the clock. Domestic abuse or, or abuse by a partner is almost always, meaning from 94 to 99% of the time, involving some form of economic abuse. So quickly, economic abuse can manifest as control over a victim's employment, preventing them from earning an income, keeping them from going to work or interviews, sabotaging their working relationships or performance, or demanding that they quit. It can manifest as control over a victim's existing funds and assets, control over bank accounts, credit cards, coerced transfer of a home lease or mortgage to an abuser, and domestic abuse knows no age limit. It is both a symptom and a tool for maintaining gender inequality, and I believe we've really only begun to shine a spotlight on the true reality of it. That being said, the more we illuminate these issues, the closer we come to finding solutions for what we can see. Providers of financial services, therefore, have an opportunity to provide a way out for victims of abuse, a way to help them to economically separate from an abuser and regain control over their financial situation by offering and openly advertising free basic payment accounts with overdraft facilities and no charges for non-digital transactions such as ATM withdrawals or printed statements. These accounts should be made available regardless of the individual having a joint account with this Spouse with a spouse or partner, whereas the current payment account directive currently allows banks to reject applications for a basic payment account if the applicant has another existing account. Previous research by Finance Watch and other organizations, including the Commission itself, has found that member states' efforts to advertise the option of a basic payment account and therefore public awareness are very low, and very low in countries like Ireland, Portugal, and Romania. I can envision quite easily alongside those advertisements that you see for abuse helplines in public bathroom stalls, banks could target those suffering from abuse and give them a way out, providing advertisements there. But in order for those who need in order for those who need a basic payment account to be aware and able to access it, and for member states to have a clear understanding of the requirements to advertise, the payment account directive must be amended to provide these clear guidelines on advertising. Cash and a payment account are perhaps the two master keys that open the gateway to all other basic financial tools. With respect from, for time, we'll have to save the discussion on gender related issues um, regarding the access and use of other basic financial tools for our next gender perspective session, though I think Patricia Suarez has some relevant and very interesting issues related to this to highlight in her presentation in just a moment. Before I close, I do have a couple of overarching suggestions for the way forward. Despite long-term recognition that the EU anti-discrimination net framework remains incomplete, the horizontal anti-discrimination directive, which would provide legal certainty to combat discrimination outside of the workplace, for our purposes, specifically in the relationship to the access of essential financial goods and services on the grounds of sexual orientation, religion, belief, or age, this proposal for a directive has been tabled since 2008 with no signs of progress. As consumer advocates, it is our duty to continue to put pressure, pressure on policymakers to move forward on this horizontal anti-discrimination directive. As an example, ageism is an issue in insurance contracts currently, with evidence that age limits for new policies are being lower, lowered despite increases in longevity. In terms of addressing the issue of pension inadequacy or pension gaps, we hope that the pan-European pension product developed at EU level will be redesigned to be safe and affordable for those on lower incomes who need to supplement their national and employment-based pensions if they have any. We also hope that there will be work done at EU level to direct member states on presenting clear information to individuals on their current pension savings throughout their working life. Finally, as the division of care seems to be a prominent cause of gender divergence in income, employment, pension inadequacy, and so on, it is critical that we put the infrastructure in place to enable both parents equal opportunity to participate in the care of their children and elderly parents. One of our members, Kofase, did an excellent presentation earlier this year highlighting the gap between fathers' desires to take on care duties, of which there was ample evidence, and the limited capacity for them to participate in this important work. We therefore commend the work being done by EU policymakers in their creation of the Caregiver Directive, which will, when implemented, put systems into place to ensure a right by every worker in every member state to four months of parental leave within their child's first eight years of life and five working days per year to care for their elderly parents. That being said, 
We are concerned that the definition of a contract and employment arrangements remain open for member states to decide, given the changing nature of work that I previously mentioned, and with the boom in short-term contracts and gig work and overall reduction in full-time employment. In any case, it is certainly a step in the right direction, though as with all the work the EU has done to mainstream gender issues, to highlight the existence and persistence of gender-based violence, to close the gaps in pay, employment, pensions, representations, yes, we may have some of the most gender equal nations within our union, but that, that does not justify complacency. There's still a long way to go and we need all hands on deck. With that, I will end my presentation and we'll open the floor to Patricia. Hello, so finally I, I could connect. So I'm very happy to be with you and thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you all the uh, all the, the the concerns that we have, and uh, also thank you to make it very easy because your presentations, Marcela's and yours, uh, has already uh, pointed many issues out that uh, will help us to understand the challenges that we have now uh, with the uh, uh, with the algorithm, the artificial intelligence, machine learning, and everything. So I will try to, to go on the types of algorithms, the data that we are feeling, the financial inclusion very quick because you have already talked about this and, uh, and very well, of course, and also the challenges. So the first thing I want to show you is uh, uh, a sentence of this woman, Ruth Bader, that you may know, because I think it's very important to understand how we can help artificial intelligence to make a possible the financial inclusion for women because artificial intelligence can help a lot but can also perpetuate the situation that we are already living so she said so many years ago <laughs> that women belong to all places where decisions are made and it should not be that women are the exception and this is important because as you will see, we still, uh, uh, years after, we are still the exception in many ways. What kind of algorithms do we have? We think, uh, we, when we talk to, uh, about algorithms, we, we, are, we think always about machine learning, but actually we, we have already algorithms in our lives because an, an algorithm means that if you do something, it will happen something. So it's action reaction. And we have already written and visual algorithms like low. And this kind of algorithms are important because you can, uh, most of the people can read and can understand. So it's easy to follow this kind of algorithm. The second type of algorithm is a, another one that is every day in our life, but is invisible. It's unwritten or it's invisible, and I'm talking about traditions. And these traditions, as you have uh, said already, Mar Marcela and Emily, uh, they are in our lives, like uh, taking care of the children, taking care of the family. It's not written, it's not visible, but we are doing this. And the last one, uh, and the, the, the one I want, I want to focus today is the digital algorithms, because they are uh, written, but they are not visible. And it's important to know that uh, this kind of algorithms are uh, uh, in a black box. We cannot see them. And even if we could, the truth is that the language they use is not universal. It's not something you learned in the school. So it's something that only software developers can understand. And this is very important because it's not like uh, the law or the traditions that is something that you, can, uh, you learn in your life. Uh, digital algorithms, you must be an expert. And here is a problem. Let's talk about data. Who is developing software worldwide? As you can see the figures, you have there the link uh, with all the, the, the data. Uh, more than 90% uh, of the population are men and only five are women. So 
So it's not that we are not in. It, it's, it's, uh, and it's not that uh, the software developers don't want women in. It is just that they are uh, 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 developing the algorithm without uh, with with all their bias because uh, and uh, this is happening. It, we the first thing we have to do is to change this. And it, I'm not talking only about women, but also different ages, different origins, different cultures. But the truth is that women are 50% uh, of the population. So the discrimination with women is <laughs> even more uh, visible than the others. The second data that I want to show you, this is uh, the developing software in the USA. Here is a little bit uh, uh, more women that, uh, that in, the, in the whole uh, world. But you can see also some bias that we can have because of the race, because of the age, the, uh, and also the salary gap. Also, the, in, in, in the engineers, there is a, a, a salary gap. About the data, I would like to say also, but you have already talked about that, Marcela and, and Emily. Uh, this, is, this is what we have. And we have to take in consideration that uh, when you are developing an algorithm, you have to provide the algorithm to, to fill the algorithm with data. And the data is historical data and it's real world. So that means that uh, uh, you are uh, uh, putting all the data over the past 10 years. And the situation is that the uh, women have this kind of issues. We have an um, an employment rate uh, lower than men when we have children and this data is is going into the algorithm and uh, and uh, and you can change this uh, pr uh, developing some certain uh, um, trying to 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 make a change but the the fact is that the society is like that and if you take the data of part-time workers, then uh, the result is really uh, sad because, uh, as you can see, women have more uh, part-time uh, jobs, which means that we have lower incomes. And this is also the data we are giving to the algorithm. And this has consequences, of course, in financial exclusion because uh, the data is that we earn uh, our salary, our wage are lower. Uh, uh, we, as you can see, we, we have a gap in account ownership. You have also, uh, Marcela gave many data about this, but this is the data that we are uh, giving to the algorithm. And if you don't make any change, the issue, the, the discrimination, will be perpetuated. And there is also a, a gender gap in back credit access. Uh, if this is a study. You can see all, you, of course, you can share my presentation and you have all the links there if you want to read more about this. And you can see this, this study is, uh, is, uh, has been made, uh, written by a Bank of Spain experts. And uh, as you can see, uh, female entrepreneurs are less likely to ask for a loan. Uh, if you take a step uh, uh, before, you can see that there are less uh, uh, female entrepreneurs than men. And once you decide to, to take the challenge and to make your own company and to, to, to try to, to, to make something different, then females are less likely to ask for a loan. So there is also a bias inside us uh, that if you compare with men, they, they in certain way, the culture is that they, they don't have issues uh, asking for a loan. Um, but the consequence is that, that women are less likely to receive a loan in the first year of the firm. So it's like banks don't trust women in the first year when they are in entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs and they, they prefer to wait one year. Let's see what happens. 
Although, and this is a very important, those uh, women who get a loan have better loan performance. So even though we, we have this kind of uh, barriers to access to credit. And the conclusion of uh, this expert is that uh, all these point uh, to implicit unconscious in discrimination. So I, 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 I will finish here uh, with the challenges. I think uh, it's important, uh, maybe this is like, a, like, I am writing a letter to, to Santa, but I think really that we must change. And, I, and Emily talked about this, it's really, we have to take serious the European social uh, challenges. So we have to improve diversity in software developers. If we don't do this, it won't change. We have also to audit algorithms to overcome biases. It's true that they, they, the, the developers and the companies don't want to show how they um, make the algorithms because of uh, intellectual property, but, but we must develop a kind of system to audit in an ethical way algorithms. And in, here in Spain, there is already one a company for, called Ethics that is doing this kind of job, trying to overcome biases by auditing the algorithms. And I think this is really important. We, and I ask the Commission, we su must support measures to achieve women economics independence and overcome gaps. Because if the society uh, uh, remain uh, like that, the algorithms will also, also remain uh, perpetuating discrimination. So we have to overcome the wage gap, the employment gap, the entrepreneurship gap, and also the gender parenting gap. And with this, I, I finish, and I, I think that it's, it's good because we are over the time. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so much, Patricia. Yeah, unfortunately, I just want to apologize to everyone who's attending today. It seems that we had way too much information to share and we won't have time for uh, an open Q&A session. Um, but if you would like, you can send questions by email uh, to contact at finance.watch.org. If I'm incorrect, I'll have one of my tech assistants let me know. Um, we'll also be sending a follow-up email so you'll have contact information for us. Um, just something that struck me as interesting, I'll give a few closing words. The gender bias distribution of software developers, I also read uh, something early this morning about how it applies to how uh, people are be giving, giving uh, funds for women who are studying environmental degradation and how we can address that. So uh, we haven't even had time to touch on how macroeconomic governance in the EU, uh, the review currently being underway affects the availability of infrastructure to support financial inclusion for all genders. We haven't talked about how uh, unlocking financial inclusion for all will make us more productive, more sustainable as a society. Um, yeah, there, there's so much work left to do. And I think that should be the main takeaway point for today. We all come from different countries. We speak different languages. We have different experiences and life circumstances, but we all just want to be able to be included. Um, to make sure everyone gets there means learning about these realities that are different from your own and intentionally creating financial and social inclusion by design. I hope you walk away from this dialogue feeling inspired to do that work with us. Finance Watch will be hosting more gender dialogue sessions in 2022. Um, we have a lot of ideas for where we see this work going, but the door is open for more. Please reach out to us if you would like to present an idea, issue, or initiative at our next session, and let us know if you see an opportunity for us to collaborate um, with any of the panelists on board in research or in advocacy in the future. I look forward to continuing the conversation and doing this important work with you all. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.